name is uh, Yujip Wan from Hanyang University. Um, I will talk about the barrier in Able IoS Tech for fly storage. Um, this work has been presented in February year 2019 at FAST, and it's got a word best paper. Um, I'll make sure that I'll finish it on time at 4.55 so that there's lots of foods waiting out there. Um, this is the modern iOS stack. Uh, we all know that modern iOS stack is orderless. Um, there's application, and there is a disk drive, and there is this side of the green rectangle is called host. And the right hand side of the rectangle is called a storage device. That's all we know. And then in the host, there is an iOS scheduler. So application issues a request to the iOS scheduler. And the dispatch queue uh, of the device driver picks up the request and dispatch the co converts it, converts the request to the command and dispatch to the storage device. And there is a command queue on the storage controller. And the storage controller firmware places the incoming command to wherever it wants to place. And then the command in the queue is serviced, which means that the requested data blocks are transferred to the storage or from the storage to the host. And then when the data blocks are transferred from the host to the S3 device, it is first placed on the write-back cache. And then it is flushed from the write-back cache to the S3 surface. So um, as you see, there are uh, multiple layers here, IO scheduler, dispatch queue, and command queue, and write-back cache. So in each layer, the algorithm reorders, coalesces, merges the request at its own disposal. So um, the order in which the application issues a request is entirely different from the order in which the associated data blocks reach a storage surface. That's why the modern IOS tag is called orderless. That's very plain, simple operating system 101 contents. So um, here, the incoming order and outgoing order are different because of those scheduling activities like CFQs and stuff like that. And um, the order in which the commands are dispatched to the storage device and the order in which the associated commands are serviced are different for many reasons because of timeouts and retry and command priority. And also, the order, the data block which is a storage surface is different from the orders in which the data blocks are transferred because of many reasons, including cache replacement algorithms and page table updates, like version of the FTL. All right. So there are a full bunch of uncertainties in modern IO stack. That's, that's what we are facing. OK. So um, you, will, you will understand, and you will uh, keep singing four characters, I, D, X, and P, and each knows order in which the uh, requests are issued, requests are dispatched, the requests are transferred, or associated DMAs are transferred, and then the associated data blocks are persisted. So you, you might want to remember these four characters, I, D, X, and P, okay? And I and D, I and D is different, and D and X is different, and X and P is different. Okay, that's due to scheduling activities of modern IO stack. All right. Okay. Oops. Okay. Next important thing is the story order. A storage order is the order in which the data blocks are made durable. And application wants to enforce some order in which the storage data blocks are made durable. So from issue order 
to the persist order, they want to enforce some orders. Okay. To enforce some orders, you have to satisfy some partial order between the three pairs of equations. I and D has to be the same, so issue order, and we have to maintain some partial order between issue order and dispatch order, and between dispatch order and transfer order, and between the transfer order and persist order. If you can satisfy all these orders, then you can satisfy the transfer, sorry, storage orders in the all the way in the entire IR stack. Okay. So um, uh, here, the application, once the red guy reaches the disk surface, last. Okay. Somehow, then, uh, even though these IO schedulers, dispatch queues, command queues, and firmware of the right package algorithm shuffles the incoming request when sending it to the next layer, it has to infer some orders so that red guy remains the last in the sequence. Okay. So, um, and controlling the storage order is essential requirement to modern IO stack, right? In database logging, you have to send the log first and make it durable and send the commit block. And file system journaling, the same thing. Soft updates, same thing. <laughs> and out of place update, card based file system, same thing. You have to enforce some orders in which the data blocks are written to a certain surface to maintain the integrity of the user data as well as the entire file system or storage device. Okay, so logging, there's logging, there's commit and checkpoint. So applications, whether it is a DBMS or file system, you have to enforce some orders in which these blocks are made durable. But the problem is the IO stack, what we are having now is orderless. Okay. IO scheduler shuffles the request on its own. Dispatch queue imposes the priority on its own. And command queue uh, service the incoming request on its own. And there is another uh, dimension of uncertainties, the write back cache algori algorithm. Write back cache replacement algorithm. Um, okay, so um, that's the, all right, let me, let me pay attention to the time. Um, next move the theme is slightly. This is, the modern story device. There is a um, tiny UFS 2.0 story device pumping the 45K IOPS. Intel Optane pumps 300K IOPS. And 437TN, manufacturer of Samsung, they pumps the data at 70K IOPS. Okay, and even um, very, very high performance story device reads and writes a data block in one million eyes per second. They are super fast, super, super storage device. This is what storage vendors claim. Am I sound clear? Um, can everybody hear me in the back? Okay. And, but let's look at what the service provider says. Okay, this is Facebook. And Cassandra, it writes like 250, 2,500 ops per second. MySQL transactions, 1.1K ops per second. And SQLites, 274 ops per second insertions per second. And the service provider shouts that IO is bottleneck. Okay, so uh, the, the numbers doesn't match. Okay, one million IOPS, this is read for, for write, it is 100K ops per second. And here, we observe that um, a few thousand ops per second. Of course, individual uh, transactions consist of like three to four writes, okay? So if you multiply it by three, but still it's far less than what they claim here is a search performance. I mean, again, the numbers doesn't, doesn't add up. 
if you look at the uh, storage queue, okay, the command queue at the storage device rarely goes beyond two or three. So storage device is idling, okay. So why? So the number doesn't add up. Um, this is a interesting uh, graph of modern storage device. This is the sustained um, buffered write performance of these uh, storage devices, ranging from the EMMC 5.0 embedded flash to the rate of flash storage. This is OCZ Revit Drive. Um, it's a RAID 4 of uh, RAID, RAID 0 of four disks, and each disk has eight channels. It's this, so basically a 32 channel SSD. Um, here is the performance of buffered I.O. for each of these three devices. And the y-axis is the ratio between the buffered write performance and the write followed by fdata sync, which the storage device application, it's a, a write followed by fdata sync is a standard practice to enforce the storage order among the write request. So here, for example, here, this is a, a rectangle, Galaxy S5 EMS 5.0. Um, it yields like 1,300 IOPS per second buffered write, but if you interleave every write with FDATE sync, then the performance goes down to only 20% of the buffered write. But as you increase, go through the higher performance uh, flash drive, the ratio between two uh, decreases severely. For example, if you consider like 32 channel SSD, then in buffered write, uh, it is like 23, um, what is it, um, 230K IOPS per second. But if you interleave every write with after data sync, then it is like 22.2K IOPS. The performance of enforcing the storage order is as is, is drastically decreases, okay? This is disaster. Storage vendors make larger storage device and they claim that they make the faster and quicker and ultra high performance storage device um, using multiple channels, multiple ways, larger write back caches, but if it comes to the point that the application has to enforce the storage order, then they, the application sees the naked part of what the flash storage can de deliver. Okay, so so it's it's going to decrease further and further, I expect. Okay. okay. Then the the third theme is that. Why has IOS tech been odorless for the last half, five decades? Okay. IOS tech has been odorless for five, like last five years. I mean, this is the hardest drive. In 1970s, this is 250 megabytes capacity. They don't sell it, they lease it, and people rent the hardest drive to store their device data. Okay. Here, um, there is rotating media in the uh, the, uh, the storage device consists of the plata and arm. So there's rotating media, and disk arm moves around to read the uh, data blocks. And um, how the storage vendors lay out, uh, places the sectors among these uh, cylinders, the top secrets of the storage device. So there is no way for host to control the order in which the contents in the write back caches are flushed to the disk because of the disk scheduling algorithm is unknown to the host. So there, was a, uh, there has been a big battle on whether host is allowed to control the storage order, but um, eventually, the disk vendor has won. 
So the scheduling, this scheduling algorithm is top secrets hidden inside, deep inside this, this black box. So there is no way for host to control the order in which the data blocks in the write back cache are persisted to the storage media. So this cannot be satisfied. Due to this very reason, the entire conditions cannot be satisfied. And because of this reason, the modern stack, the orders cannot be controlled. And this is the reason why the modern IO stack has been orderless for the last 50 years. Next, um, so uh, in, the, in the orderless IO stack, orderless IO stack Despite that modern IOS tech has been orderless, application needs to enforce the storage orders. Okay. So what they do is they employ transfer and flush. If you want to ensure, if the application wants to ensure that um, the write of A and write of B reach the disk space in this order, what the modern application do and modern IOS tech do is transfer and flush. What they do is they send out a request and waiting for it to be serviced, that the social data blocks are transferred to the write back cache of the storage device. Once it completes, then it sends a flash command, then it flushes, and then once it completes, then it sends the next command. So this is how the modern IO stack or application infers the storage order among the write request. Isn't it the disasters? Okay, so because of this very, very uh, transfer and flux mechanism, if you see, if the two right requests are interleaved by DMA and flush, then what we see is that Um, if we do not enforce the orders among the right request, then the host can keep sending the request and storage can keep servicing the request. However, if you enforce the order, if we need to enforce the order between the right request, then these yellow box and green box are interleaved with transfer and flush, and then it's going to be a very, and it becomes inefficient. That's why. Uh, the transfer and flush, all the preserving overhead is going to be very serious in modern IO stack. So um, in, we, we measure a simple experiment in M NVMe PM1725. It writes 120K IOs. But if you want to enforce the ordering guarantee, then the performance goes down to 20,000 IOs per second. So the performance decreases down to only 2%. So this is why we observe the even the very poor performance when it comes down to the point when we need to infer storage order. Okay. So um, we decide to make some changes in overhaul the IOS tech so that um, the IOS tech can free the underlying storage from the transfer and flush overhead. Um, in 1970s, in HDD, um, it has sick and rotational delay, and the host control cannot control the persistent order. As a result, the IOS tech becomes orderless. As a result, the application has to use transfer and flush to enforce the storage order. Okay. But uh, in the era of SSD, the flash storage does not have sick and rotational delay. So it, a host may be allowed to control the persist order without significant overhead. And then IOS tag may become order preserving. And then we may be free, the IOS tag can may be made to free from the transfer order, transfer and flush overhead in control storage order. So we believe that it's time to rethink the way the control the storage order in modern IOS tag. <coughs> so we, 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 we overhaul the entire stack from the 
the flash from my algorithms to entire your file system. So there are basically three themes. The first one is barrier enable storage. And then we make the block device layer or the preserving. And then we slightly change the file system based upon the or the preserving block device layer. And then we'll show that how it can benefit the applications. So the first thing is barrier enabled high storage. So there are there are big three things. Here is a storage device, and this is block device layer, and this is file system. So we are going to show how we uh, change each of these layers in in the next like 15 minutes. First one is to make the to control the persist order. Um, actually, in year 2005 the EMMC community has proposed a very, very interesting command. It's a barrier, which nobody uses it. Um, if we use write A, write B, and write C, and we put barrier in write D, then if some EMMC controller is conformant to uh, barrier command, then it ensures that um, the data blast transferred ahead of barrier command is guaranteed to be made durable after the one transferred after the barrier command. So that's the role of barrier command. That has been uh, standardized in like 12 years ago. Okay. But this command, if you look at this command, it, the barrier command allows the host to control the persist order, right? You put barrier command somewhere in the middle, and then you ensure that the data blocks that has been transferred ahead before the barrier command is made it durable ahead of whatever transferred after barrier command. So um, we devise we more, we devise a simple command. Uh, we there is a write and barrier, and we made this command as a single command barrier write. So what happens is that if you if the hosts send uh, four commands barrier uh, write a, write b, and barrier write c, and write d, then uh, if the storage controller can uh, service the barrier command, then it guarantees that the block a, block b, and block c are made durable ahead of block d. That's, I would believe that is a historical moment of modern uh, storage history. Here, now, uh, with barrier write command, the host can control the persistoda without flush. Okay. Now we can eliminate, or now we can satisfy the fundamental conditions which has not been able to be satisfied for the last 50 years. Now it's time to make the block device layer uh, orderless, order preserving. Okay, so this part is, uh, has been made to uh, satisfy the order preserving. And here, this is this patch queue in our scheduler, and I'll show you how we can make this layer order preserving. Um, there are three. Th we did three things in making the block device layer or the preserving. We define, this is very, very simple. The, the number of codes is like a couple of thousand lines and all the codes are available on, made available online. So um, first one, um, we, uh, before there is no request type uh, such as orderless and order preserving. But here in this new IO stack, we separate uh, we define two types for the request. One is orderless request, and then order preserving request. And then among the order preserving requests, uh, there are special uh, requests, which is the barrier request. So uh, what, we, what it shows is that, assume that there are uh, three blocks, A, B, E, and there are two blocks, G, H. An application wants to ensure that A, B, E are made durable ahead of GH, okay? And then there is a sequence of blocks A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and it goes through the block layer. Then 
what we would like to achieve in this order preserving block layer is whatever uh, happens in the box, we want to ensure that GH is always follows the ABE. Okay. So what we do is that uh, there are a total of eight blocks, but we want to enforce the order on only five of these blocks, ABE and GH. So uh, we make the, the ABE and GH as a order-preserving request, and among these order-preserving requests, at the end of each order-preserving sets, uh, we put the last request as a barrier. Then the block layer reshuffles everything, but it preserves the order among these partial relationships, the ABE and GH. So if you look at here, then it comes A, B, and E, and it goes through the block device layer. The, the order among this set has been changed. A becomes the last request, but the A, B, E as a single set still remains a single set, and there is Z, H remains at the same set. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is making the dispatch module or the preserving. Um, what, he, what we would like to do here is um, we would like to ensure that the IO commands are serviced in the order the host has directed. And we exploit the command priority called ordered, which has been barely used before. I mean, we are, I mean, uh, all the flags and options we are using is already there, but ha it hasn't been used properly, and we are exploiting those things. Um, if you, we uh, send write A, and we send barrier write B, and write C, when, what we do here is we set the command priority of barrier write commands that ordered. And then um, the dispatch module uh, preserves the order. Um, SCSI interface uh, defines three command priorities. This is head of the queue, and ordered, and simple. Uh, if a certain command is set as the head of the queue and host sends the command, then the controller puts that command always at the head, head of the command queue. Uh, if you set the command priority of a SCSI into ordered, then that command is placed at the end of the command queue. If you put uh, if you set the priority of a command as simple, then that command is placed anywhere in the queue after the ordered command and after the head of the queue priority command. And interestingly, nobody has used the ordered priority command before. I mean, very few, right? But uh, here, uh, what we do is, let me go back to the previous slide. What we could use is that, um, if you set the priority of barrier right command as ordered, then it ensures that that barrier right command is serviced after all the preceding commands are serviced. And then the following commands cannot be put or cannot be serviced ahead of the barrier right command because most block device layer sets the right command as a simple priority. Okay, so by by setting a command priority as an ordered, we can simply make the dispatch module order preserving. So it's, it's beautiful. Okay. So um, using the order preserving dispatch, um, this is the way the legacy IO stack enforce the transfer order. What they do is they send the right command waiting for completion of DMA, and then send the next write command. The legacy, in the legacy IO stack, it has to interleave the two-hour request with a trans DMA transfer to guarantee the order in which the social data blocks are transferred. But uh, if we can make the dispatch model order preserving, then the host can send the two commands in back-to-back -back manner, and then 
um, the storage device can service the two requests in order. There is a big difference between the two because here the host has to switch the context and the caller has to block until the transfer completes. But here you don't have to. So uh, if you use the order preserving dispatch, then caller does not have to block and then um, the host does not observe DMA transfer overhead. So uh, now we can uh, eliminate another condition here. So um, it's time to make the I/O scheduler or the preserving for making I equals D, the issue, uh, the align the issue order with the dispatch order. So um, what we do is that um, um, when there is a recoming, incoming request from the upper layer, once the barrier request arrives, then it blocks the queue and shuffles the request around, and then makes it going out. So. Um, the scheduler reschedule IO requests within the epoch basis so that they can preserve the partial order among the different epochs. Like this. Okay, so with this IO scheduler, we can enforce the dispatch order and issue order, and then all the three conditions can now be satisfied with all the preserving IO stack. So now, with this IO stack and with this uh, storage device, the, the application can control the storage order without transfer and flush. So here, this is the way the legacy block layer enforces the storage order. They have to interleave the two requests with transfer and flush. Now, uh, in the order preserving block layer, the host can control the storage order without flush and without image transfer and without the color being blocked and without, no context, without context switches. So this is a very important implications. That's good. So um, given that IOS tech is order preserving, uh, let's see how we can change the file system design. Um, if you have any questions, feel, feel free to jump in or interrupt me. Any questions so far? It's good? Okay. So, there is actually one. Uh, in each set, what are you sending along with the barrier command to assure that all the members of the set are flushed or, or written before the members of other sets? So, um, we, we are assuming that um, the the sets are fed to the queue in, in sequential order. I'm not sure I, I understand your question correctly. Um, you have A, B, C, and you have G and H. Uh -huh. right? How do you assure that uh, B is written before G and H? You know, if, if you're sending your barrier command after A, B, C, after C. Uh -huh. How do you assure that A and, and B are in that set that uh, must be written? So um, there, um, we assume that the storage device uh, satis uh, supports the barrier command. Is that the right answer to your questions? Okay, but, but in his example, he also had other uh, blocks that were not part of the set. I assume there's more metadata that needs to be passed, but I, I haven't talked about that. Okay, okay. Anyway, um, so let's, okay. Um, in, the, in the existing I file system, there is two system calls, fsync and fdatasync, which are used for both durability guarantee and ordering guarantee. So um, now, because the IOS tag is order preserve, can preserve the order, we can separate those two things, durability guarantee and ordering guarantee, and we define two additional uh, primitives for just for ordering guarantee, f barrier. 
and F data barrier. Okay. F barrier is the same as F sync, except that it does not flush the request. F data barrier is the same as F data sync, except that it does not issue the flush. So these ones uh, just simply guarantees the order without guaranteeing the durability. So we define uh, the two primitives that separates the durability guarantee from ordering guarantee. And let's look at the design of F-Sync here. Um, F-Sync and EXT4, it, um, it writes 30 pages and uh, journal logs. Once these two are made durable, then it writes the journal commit block. If you look at this diagram, you can easily understand how it works. Um, when F-Sync will call, the application first uh, sends uh, the data blocks to the storage device. And then it blocks here. It wakes, the application wakes up and control the transfer to JBD thread. And JBD thread transfer the journal log blocks to the storage device. And then wait for its completion. Once it completes, then it sends a flush command, actually the flush for command with the JC block. So this is the full life of an F-Sync. Okay, it consists of, it has two flushes here and here. And it has three DMA transfers, and it has a uh, lots of context switches. This is F-Sync. Okay, so this is why everybody worries about how to improve F-Sync overhead or performance. Okay, but uh, if you sh if the underlying I/O stack is auto preserving, we make this thing uh, simpler because um, here what we could what what we have to do is that. All we have to do is these things, right? Make the dirty pages and journal log blocks first made durable, and then make the JC, the journal block, durable. So this is what we have to do. And this procedure becomes a lot simpler when the line block device layer can preserve the order. This is the difference. Here, this is the picture we have just observed, the F-Sync and EXE4. Um, if we assume that underlying black device layer can preserve the order, then what we could is that the file systems dispatch the right request, and then the JBD thread dispatch the right request for JD and JC, and then these blocks are guaranteed to be transferred in order. Once a transfer completes, then the host can simply send one flush command. So as you can see, um, there is a lot less context switches and uh, due to flushes, number of flushes um, decrease from two to one. Okay. Okay. And then uh, this part is slightly tricky. Um, so um, we have observed that we can make the the other preserving block device layer can make the F sync and journaling much efficient. Then we go another step and we separate the control plane and data plane in the journaling into different thread. So we see that um, dispatching the write request for JD, uh, journal logs, and dispatching write request for journal commit block as a control activity. And making these two durable as a data plane activity. And then, uh, we, if we um, allocate, uh, and then what we do is we s uh, allocate separate thread. Okay, yeah. we allocate separate threads for control plane activity and data plane activity, and name each thread as a commit thread and flush thread. What the design changes here is there is f application, there is JBD thread, and there is storage device, and then. What we do here is that we separate the journaling module into two threads activity. There is, uh, in journaling module, there is commit thread that is responsible for submitting the request. And then there is flush, flush thread that is responsible for making them durable. Then the advantage of this uh, dual thread design is that you can uh, separate the durability guarantee system calls from the ordering guarantee only system calls. Okay. Um, as I said before, the F barrier is the counterpart of F sync 
but it does not issue the flush operation. So what the F barrier is implemented is the F barrier returns right after commit thread returns a request. Okay, then it guarantees that the um, duty pages and associated log blocks and commit blocks are measurable in order, but it does not guarantee that they are durable. And I've seen control flow like this. Okay, so the, this dual thread design uh, allows the efficient separation of the ordering guarantee and durability guarantee. Okay, and the salient part of the system call is F data barrier. Um, uh, what we do is, uh, if we, uh, if the application issues a system call called F data barrier, then what it does is that it writes the last 30 pages as an order preserving write. Okay, there is 30 pages going, and the last 30 pages written as the order preserving write. Okay, and then what guarantees is that then the, all the preceding writes are measurable ahead of the last 30 pages with all the preserving write barrier. So uh, here, if, um, if you write hello, and if you call F data barrier, and if you write word, then the barrier enabled for barrier first ensures that hello and word are measurable in order but it does not incur any context switches, it does not block the color, or it's not, it does not issue any flush. Okay. So uh, write hello with barrier write, and then write hello, then these two are transferred in order and made durable in order. So in enforcing the thread uh, to the order, there is no DMA transfer, there is no DMA flush over it, and there is no context switches. So we have implemented this in PC server and smartphones. And then uh, let me just finish my talk because the time is almost up. Let me finish my talk with this, this slide. There is four bars here. There's UFS, there's plain SSD. This is SSD with super cap. The interesting thing is that this is buffered right. The right hand, the plain white bar is just buffered right performance. And the leftmost one is the performance of write followed by F data sync. Okay. This one, the second on the left, is the one with write followed by F data sync, but F data sync does, is made to skip the flush. So uh, here, each write requests are interleaved with only DMA transfer. Okay. And the last one, the third one from the left is the one with barrier FS. So here, each request are transmitted in order with barrier write, and each are not interleaved. Uh, each one does not have flush operation, and each one does not have transfer operation at all. So uh, as we can see, we can um, exploit almost the performance of the order preserving write is almost as good as the buffered write. Okay. So we, this is uh, flush operation is eliminated and then the transfer operation is also eliminated and then the overall performance becomes uh, similar to the buffered write over So. As you see, the eliminating the transfer of it becomes critical. Okay. Okay, so uh, we, f we modify the SQLite. We port the SQLite on the order preserving overhead, and then we show some performance improvement, and we port our, we port my SQL to the order preserving IO stack, and we see some, like, 35x improvement and 43x improvement. Okay. So um, f I think the the supporting the barrier write command or barrier command is, is is not an option, but it's it has to support barrier command. And even in the as we as we observed, even in the super cap SSD, it has to support. I believe it has to support barrier command. So the objective of this IOSTEC uh, design is to improve the IOSTEC efficiency that the high performance 
uh, high performance flash storage can fully exploit its potential and make the performance as good as its underlying which is the utilizer which is almost uh, 100 percent. So I think it's time for a change. We have been under the legacy of a hard disk drive for 50 years and it's time for change the entire stack to fit for the flash storage. The source code is available here and you are welcome to download and review the source code. Okay. There are many workloads which are used non-buffered IOs. What about non-buffered IOs? Non-buffered IOs are the ones that are used for the storage. Right, right. What about those non-buffered IOs? Non-buffered IOs. Uh, you can port you know, non-buffered IO to barrier write, and they can also be beneficial. So you are saying for non-buffered uh, non IO, you're going to see the similar benefits here? Um, the benefits are going to be slightly different. For example, if you lose lots of um, F data sync, then you will see lots of benefits. But if you uh, use, for some application, you won't see that many benefits, even though you port the applications to the other, other preserving of right request. Oh, that's, that's actually very good questions, and we have to solve the problem. Because this, this order preserving is for a single queue. Okay. If the packet storage is not remote, I'm sorry? Oh, um, that's another part of the story, and that's good question. But um, yes, it has to be preserved. But I don't, I haven't thought about the way to preserve it. Okay. So I mean, that's a very good question. I mean, the NVMe it provides multiple queues. The reason I believe that there has to be multiple multiple queue is because with a single queue, uh, so far in the underlying IO stack, there is no way for a host to saturate this storage device because of the transfer and flush overhead. So they increase the number of queues so that they can saturate the storage device, even though a single queue has a transfer and flush overhead. But if you can eliminate the transfer and flush overhead from the single queue, then there's no way for providing like 64K queues to the host. I mean, it, it consumes memory from the host and makes everything so complicated. So I believe that um, many, um, the transfer, over, transfer flush overhead is a big obstacle in the modern IO stack. And there has been a lot of resorts to, 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 to bypass those the obstacles. But it's time to entirely eliminate those obstacles. The transfer flush is to make the IO stack with the preserving. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.